Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for giving us a place to come and worship you. Thank you for giving us a heart that loves you, for, for moving in our hearts to change us to the people that you created us to be, your people. Help us to grow and learn together as we study your word, as we pray with one another, as we meet at each other's houses, as we eat meals. God, help us to be your people. Help us to draw the people that you want us to be in fellowship with into the fold, into, with, into communion with you and with us. Any anger or fear or pain or sadness, dispel all that so that we might hear your word, your word alone. Just for a moment, God, help us to truly see through the mist and the veil and see your glory. I ask in the name of Christ. Amen. We begin with the Psalm of David. Um, so, if you if you have um, if you've ever listened to me preach, you know that um, I am not the greatest fan of animals in the entire world. And, uh, and and there was a time before that I actually made fun of cows and had to you know recant and and, and say I was terribly sorry to um, uh, a few of our a few of our people here. Cow lovers, that's right, yeah. And uh, I got a bunch of wonderful text messages that made my week better. <laughs> this week, this week I'm going to talk about sheep. And it, it's already come out in uh, the first hour that um, we have some different views on, on sheep. Uh, and, it, and it turns out that a theologian's view of animals is not a farmer's view of animals, always. But I think that we can find common accord in the Psalm of David, the 23rd Psalm. Now this is a, a psalm that a lot of people have, have read, and, and some people have even committed it to memory. This is a very excellent place to start if you want to start reading the scripture in the 23rd Psalm because of all the great things that it says. And it begins with verse 0 that says it's a psalm of David. Now we know that David was the king we know that he was the shepherd boy, right? So he knows a thing or two about sheep. He knows a thing or two about sheep. But I don't. I don't I've never been a shepherd. The only thing I've ever done is bury dogs that got hit by cars. Or cats. It's the truth. I'm not a shepherd in the sense of actually taking care of physical sheep. So what I know is only what I have studied. Exactly like what I tell you guys to do in the Bible study uh, process. You spend time learning the context of what's going on so that you can better understand the text. So that's what I did. I studied sheep and shepherding to try to gain some insight into this, this text. Let me show you why. Right here, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. <coughs> he leads me by the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. I'm not a very good artist, but I think that there's some really, really good insights here. First and foremost, the Lord is the shepherd. Now, the Lord, that's, again, the name of God. And we talked last week about the name of God and the importance of the name of God. But He is the shepherd. So that leaves us with nothing that we need. He has and provides everything we need, just like the shepherd does for the sheep. <clears throat> and he makes us lie down 
in green pastures. Now this one took some research, I'm going to be honest with you, because I didn't understand why they needed to lay down in green pastures, but what I found out is that sheep will continue to eat until they are so full that they fall over and become what, the, what they call cast sheep. And then if they, the shepherd doesn't come and turn them over and make them lay down, they'll fill up with gas and die. They'll fill up and die if the shepherd doesn't come and help them. So he makes them lie down in green pastures. This is awesome. See, the shepherd takes them to green pastures. This isn't arid deserts or nasty places. This is prime land. And it's plenty for all of them. It's prime grassland for these sheep. And he makes them lie down in green pastures. He lets, leads them beside still waters. Again, I, I wasn't entirely aware of why he needed to lead them beside still waters. And so I called um, one of my professors and, and talked to him a little bit about, um, because he had given a sermon series on the 23rd Psalm when I lived in Texas. And so I was asking him about the still waters, and he said something that was very helpful. He said it's very difficult to drink out of a fire hose. You ever thought about that? Somebody turns a fire hose on, it's hard to get your a sip of water. Just like it's hard to get a sip of water out of a waterfall. Or a rapid. But he leaves them beside still waters. Not stagnant, nasty waters, but a nice easy place that they can get a nice cool drink why is that so important you're going to find that there's a lot of talk in the scripture about the living water you're going to find that this living water is essential for us to truly be alive and I think this references foreshadows what Christ said about the living water and Him being the living water. He, he is the shepherd. He is the grassland. He is the water. Now, sheep are, are interesting creatures because they, they're very excellent at following. And we use that in a good context and a bad context in our, in our culture today. Right? If somebody calls me a sheep, it's not because they're complimenting me. Right? They're saying that I can't think for myself. I think part of the reason that God calls us sheep is because we fail to think for ourselves. But I also think that He means when He calls us sheep that we are to follow the shepherd. I think that it's very, very important that we as a people begin to think for ourselves but follow the shepherd. Don't blindly just go from point A to point B. But instead, when the shepherd shows you something, you show the rest of the people how to do it. Because Scott brought up uh, earlier that if the farmer shows them, you said jump in the truck, right? Yeah, he shows them to jump, one of them to jump in the truck. Guess what the rest of them will do? They'll jump in the truck. That's very helpful. Right? You don't have to go and show each sheep because they'll, they'll do what the one was shown. <coughs> we as a people, we don't like following the shepherd. Especially as an American people. Because we are our own people. Right? We do what we want. We pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. And we make things happen. Right? Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a sheep. That's a wannabe shepherd. He leads us beside the still water. He makes us lie down in the green pastures. 
Because sometimes he needs to say, sit down. And he restores my soul. Interesting, right? All this imagery of farming and, and, and shepherding, and then he restores my soul. This goes to show you that what is David actually talking about? He's talking about his relationship with the Almighty. It's not just a dissertation on farming. Right? The surface is talking about sheep and shepherds. But the underlying truth is that God is restoring his soul. Because he leads him by the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Whose name's sake? It's for God's name's sake. It's not for David's name's sake. He leads me by the paths of righteousness. Righteousness. A big, long, two-dollar word that means right. You can take the justness off and it's still the same word. It means do what's right. Lead you by the paths of righteousness means that He leads you by the right path. If you find yourself on a wrong path, what should you do? A, continue on. Or B, turn around and go back until you know where you are and begin again. Now I argue that B is a better choice, even though you have to backtrack, because continuing on in the wrong direction means you will never get to where you're going. That makes no sense at all to continue on the wrong path. You need to be led to the right path. And if you find yourself on the wrong path, go back and try again. God wants His people to be righteous because His name is righteous. And He wants His people to be righteous because they're His people. Which means His name is on the line. He adopted us into the family and, and we don't always act like we're part of the family. But it's for His name's sake that He leads us on these right paths. Not because He needs to save His name, but because He wants us to be the embodiment of the glory that He deserves. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That last line baffled me. That last line absolutely baffled me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So I did, some, I did some more research on the staff, and I couldn't find an actual shepherd's staff. That's a candy cane that I painted brown. But it, it'll get the idea. The, the shepherd's staff has a crooked end. Now, why does he have a crooked end? I, I remember seeing when I was a little kid the cartoons, and there would be somebody on stage, and they would bring the little hook out and jerk them off the stage. You remember? Y'all remember that? That's essentially what the shepherd's staff is designed to do is to help gently grab them by the neck just and lead them back to where they need to go. That doesn't seem like a comfort. Somebody grabbing me with a crook staff around the neck and leading me back to the right path. That doesn't seem like comfort. And the, the rod is, is what you poke them in the behind with to get them to go. Not a comfortable idea to me. But what David says is, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So I had to think about this for a while because, like I said, these are implements of, of correction. Why would correction be a comfort? Unless you knew that the one that was doing the correcting had your ultimate good in mind. And then I began to think, I understand what he's talking about. 
even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you're with me and you're not going to let me wander off and die. That's a comfort. There's a reason that little kids that are afraid of the dark want their mommy and daddy. They want comfort and protection. The shepherd is protection for the sheep and therefore is comfort. But he's also correcting the sheep, which is ultimately going to lead them on the paths that are right for them, which is a great comfort for them. And even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now this one, you may or may not have known, but there was a path between Jerusalem and... Um, thank you. <laughs> Jerusalem and Jericho. And it was a nasty path. And I did not know how to draw a valley. So that's the best I could do. So I just put a skull and crossbones on it. But anyway, that's my valley of the shadow of death. And this was a nasty, hilly switchback with big boulders. And what would happen is robbers would hide on this path and jump out and beat you and take everything you own and kill you. Let me show you where this comes in. There was a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And robbers jumped out and beat him and left him for dead on the side of the road. And a priest came by and crossed on the other side of the road. This is that road. This is the Good Samaritan story. Because this path was well known for being a nasty place to be. But it was the fastest way to get from Jerusalem to Jericho. And you lose a whole bunch of altitude from Jerusalem to Jericho. So it's a nasty switchback path. David's drawing on this cultural truth and this landscape to draw a picture for the people. It doesn't matter who's hiding behind the rocks. It doesn't matter their intentions. It doesn't matter because the shepherd is there with his rod and his staff and his slingshot. And he's going to lead you on the right path. Because he loves you. And he wants to take care of you. And it's for his name's sake and his name's sake alone that you are led on the right path. This is my favorite part. <clears throat> You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Do what? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Why, why, would he, why would he go from the valley of the shadow of death and rod and staff that comfort me to this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? That seems odd, right? You, you, I got in my head, because I like to play these out like movies. So we've got this large army around, around this house that has a large banquet table in it and a, and a spread like you've never seen. And it's prepared in the presence of enemies. Shouldn't they be grabbing their swords or rods or staffs or something to take, take up arms? Who is supposed to fight our battles? Who is supposed to fight your battles? Is it you? Do sheep fight? <clears throat> Do sheep fight? Do sheep kill each other? Do they argue with one another? No. No, they don't. They really don't. 
That's us. We do all those things. But she don't. Who fights the battle for the sheep? Shepherd. Why was David so good with the slingshot? That he could kill Goliath in one shot, right between the eyes. I don't know about you, but right between the eyes is a heck of a shot from any length. Because he had done it to lions and tigers and bears, oh my, his whole life, right? That's what he had spent his life doing, protecting who? Sheep. We, because of our great shepherd, are allowed to sit at the beautiful table that he's prepared for us. And to bask in the glory and righteousness and awesomeness of our God. And he'll take some of that oil and he'll anoint our heads. Why do we anoint heads with oil? Because we like greasy hair, right? No, why do we anoint heads with oil? It's to show the Spirit flowing over and in and through them. It's to show that they are called for a specific purpose. It's to show that they are a part of this great God and His plan. And it says that you anoint my head with oil. You being who? The shepherd anoints the heads with oil. <coughs> Isn't that amazing? Think about what a privilege it is not only to have God prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies because they don't matter. <coughs> so that you can sit down and then He'll anoint your head with oil because you are that important to Him. And your cup overflows. I don't know about you, but I'm sad when my drink is gone. I would like a cup that never went dry. As a matter of fact, it just poured all over the table and I couldn't drink it fast enough. That would be amazing to me. Your cup overflows because God doesn't just give you a little or just enough. He gives you abundantly. He offers you abundance because He is that big, that powerful, that righteous, and that grace-filled. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy. Mercy is definitely what we want. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I want God's justice. Here's the truth. You don't want God's justice. No, I don't. God's justice is this. Listen carefully. God's justice is that you sinned and fell short of what He asked you to do and you deserve hell. Whether you believe in Jesus or not. Whether you've been good or not. That's justice. And God would be completely just to send every one of us to hell. And we have no way of arguing against it. Because that's justice. What we want is mercy. So I don't want to hear you saying that's not fair anymore. What's fair is you go to hell. It's a tough thought, right? But that's the truth. It's goodness and mercy. That's what we want. 
That's what Christ was given us on the cross was mercy. He took the justice. And He drank the whole cup so that there's none left. And all He asks is that you allow Him to drink the cup. He asks that you allow Him to drink the cup of justice for you. Allowing you to choose if you want to drink that cup of justice for yourself. He's not going to drag you kicking and screaming into heaven. He loves you enough to let you go. I can't imagine. I couldn't. I just can't imagine how sorrowful that must make him. To love somebody enough to let him go. To watch him make decisions that are not righteous. To continue along a path that you know doesn't lead anywhere. What kind of love is that? And yet, He never leaves them. That He's always right there. Because a good shepherd never just lets sheep wander off. He'll leave the 99 to go get one. And there's never a day in your life that God is not with you. There's never a day that He is not walking beside you, carrying you, dragging you, just telling you to stand you know, sometimes in life you can't even walk. Sometimes you just got to stand and you're doing good to just do that. And that's okay. That's okay. Because His goodness, His mercy is so abundant and so full that even though you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to worry about anything. He's got you. He's got you guys. And here's the coolest part. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. I want His grace and mercy so that I can be with Jesus forever. I don't like being separated I want to be in the house of the Lord, in the kingdom of God, forever. We, as the people of God, need to share this with our friends and neighbors. We need to invite them to come and to worship with us to learn about what's going on. And then we need to get our hands dirty and begin to do what it is that God's called us to do. I want us to be a banquet table with cups overflowing. I want goodness, mercy, righteousness to flow out of us and flow out of our gathering together so that we can represent the people of God, the house of the Lord, the family of God, the body of Christ, all those names that we've been given in the Scripture. And that we can show people how to be good sheep. How to be good sheep. Not mindless automatons. But thoughtful and willing to follow the good shepherd. Are you willing to follow the shepherd? Are you willing to then turn around when the shepherd shows you something and teach it to somebody else? We call that in, in Christianese discipleship. 
that's basically what it is. The shepherd shows you something, then you show somebody else, and they show somebody else. Eventually, everybody's jumping into the back of the truck. Just like they're supposed to. Let's be that as a body. And I promise, we won't have anything to worry about. Because even if we're in the valley of the shadow of death, we'll fear no evil because the shepherd's got us. I think this is such a great psalm. And, and I just barely scratched the surface. Now my challenge you this week, go back and read the psalm. And then read it again, and again, and again. See if you can find the bottom. See if you can plumb the depths of just this one short six-verse psalm. What you'll find is that the well of truth is deeper than you ever imagined. Just from this one psalm. Martin Luther said, if I could have any book out of the Bible, and only one book, I would take the book of the Psalms. Until I started studying the Psalms, I never knew what, why he said that. It's because every major doctrine in the Christian faith, period, is found in the Psalms. It's kind of like a, a mini Cliff's Notes to the Bible in poetry form. Truthfully. It's a great book to start studying if you want to study the Scripture. I love this psalm, and I would challenge you that this week as you're reading it, attempt to commit it to memory, if you don't remember it already. It's a good one to have on tap anytime, because it talks about the greatness of God, that He's got your back when you're in, or at the gates of hell itself. He's got you. He's guiding you. And you'll be with Him forever. This is a good one to have just on the forefront of your mind all the time. That's why it's so popular. Because it's just filled with the truth. Overflowing. That's my challenge for you guys this week.